Welcome to Foresight Friday Roundup, Foresight Health's podcast series for healthcare revolutionaries. Outcomes matter, customers count, and value rules. Hello again, everyone. This is Dave Berta, news editor at Foresight Health. It is Friday, September 24th. In the next month or two, it's going to be open enrollment season, as well as hunting season in many states. It's when millions of employees across the country choose their health plan and hunt through company emails and handouts to find out what their health benefit options are for 2022. But this enrollment period will be like no other because of COVID and how the pandemic has changed the health needs of workers. So today in the roundup, we're going to talk about what employees say they need in terms of health benefits and what employers are offering in terms of health benefits. Putting their chief human resources hats on for us today are Dave Johnson, founder and CEO of Foresight Health, and Julie Murchison, partner at Transformation Capital. Hi, Dave. Hi, Julie. How are you guys doing this morning? Dave? My wife, Terry, and I met at Harvard Kennedy School in their Master's of Public Policy program in the 80s, that long ago decade of big hair, ugly clothes, and John Hughes movies. We're heading out for a quote unquote big chill weekend on Cape Cod with several classmates and their spouses. So today I'm feeling grateful for long enduring friendships as well as the numerous lobster rolls that I'll be consuming in my immediate future. I noted that little (laughs) accent in your lobster roll. That's great. I love it. Yeah. Julie, how are you doing? Well, not quite as exciting in our household, but I have to say the US Open is over. So we're searching for a new obsession over here. Got it. Thank you. Now, before we talk about employee health benefits, let's talk about your virtual care coverage. Dave, you've had a telemedicine visit or two with your doctor. How was that covered? I had one dermatology telemedicine consult at the beginning of the pandemic after a minor procedure. The doctor wanted to check how an incision had healed. It was quick and my insurance company paid for the session. I love the convenience. Interestingly, I had another minor procedure recently, and the same physician required me to come to his office for the same post-procedure checkup. Checkup lasted the same five minutes for the physician, but my total time commitment was over two hours since I had to travel back and forth to his office, register, and wait for the consultation. Are we backsliding? Interesting. Julie, how about you? Does your plan pay for telemedicine visits? Well, to be honest... I don't know, but I have to think that they do. (laughs) And like most consumers, I really don't care. But I will say that I know I've been inconvenienced also during the pandemic in trying to see my dermatologist virtually and having to do so on their specific, really difficult to understand technology and how to access it and how to use it as opposed to just using FaceTime. And we had to do that so she could bill it. So, you know, there are hiccups here and there, that's for sure. Yeah. Got to have a paper trail. Thanks, Julie. I did have one telemedicine visit, which I I think I mentioned on an earlier show. It was a two-minute phone call with a nurse practitioner who said I probably ate some bad food. I don't remember paying anything for it. I didn't have an upfront copay, and I never got a bill for a copay afterwards. I know it's not free, so somebody paid for it. I think collectively, we agree that uh, we're working out some bugs in the system here. All right. Anyways, let's talk about what employees want from their employers in terms of health benefits. Mercer recently released a health on demand survey of 14,000 employees in 13 countries. About 2,000 of those were here in the U.S. Here are some of the top line findings. 51% of the U.S. respondents said they want coverage that reduces their cost of mental health treatments and medications. 55% of the respondents in the U.S. said they want a customized package of benefits to meet their individual needs. And 80% of the U.S. respondents said they plan to increase their use of digital health tools moving forward. Dave, what are your takeaways from the Mercer survey? Do you see the benefit needs of employees changing in the year ahead? As a writer, I love that Mercer starts the report with this observation and question, quote, employees have something important to tell you. Employer support matters. Are you listening? Quote. That immediately got my attention. It turns out that employees have strong opinions on what they need and want from their health insurance benefits. You hit the highlights, Dave, better integrated mental health services, customized benefits, and more digital tools. 
let's touch on each of these. On mental health services, it's just crazy that American healthcare segments mental health and physical health care services. It's like going to a car mechanic who says, I can fix your engine. Here's an 800 number to see about fixing your brakes. A car needs both to function. Body and brain need to function well together for people to enjoy great health. It's not complicated. With the pandemic, employees are screaming at the top of their lungs that they want integrated, holistic care services tailored to their needs. That includes more comprehensive mental health services. The emphasis on digital health tools, apps, as well as telemedicine visits is also revealing. Mercer found a big bump in employee interest in digital health tools from their 2019 survey. We may look back and see the pandemic as the watershed event that truly launched digital health care into the general population. I will know when we reach this digital health nirvana, when we start referring to telemedicine and digital health care as simply medicine and health care. One other important thread from the Mercer report, employees that believe their employers have provided great benefits during this very stressful pandemic year were both healthier and less likely to leave their jobs. Mercer's CEO and president, Martine Furland, captured the important link between benefits and employee resilience with this quote on the study's findings. The research is clear, employers that place health and humanity at the center of business transformation will build a more energized and adaptable workforce that is better able to preserve through periods of crisis. Hear, hear. Thanks, Dave. Julie, what jumped out at you from the Mercer survey? Was it what you expected or were there any surprises? Well, I can't say that much of it surprised me, with the exception of one of the findings that Dave alluded to, which is this. 52% of respondents that had a large variety of health and well-being benefits and resources said that their benefits are the reason to stay with their company. And this surprises me because all I'm hearing from health benefit leaders and employers these days is about massive retention problems, major churn going on, difficulty in competing for talent acquisition, and it's happening everywhere at every level. So I guess I'm surprised, honestly, that that number is that high. And this also kind of made me chuckle. I'm not surprised to hear that 59% of U.S. employees say they feel some level of stress. I think that's you know, been talked about for a long time now. But I did find it quite telling that 25% report being highly or extremely stressed compared with only 16% in the U.K. So while I'm chuckling, it's also really sad. We, as U.S. employees, have the highest percentage of stress among the 13 countries included in the survey. And can we hazard a guess as to why we have more stress? I think it comes back to our safety net, which we really don't feel like we have. We have a fraction of the safety net services that other countries have. And the impact of our social service policy is coming out in the stress and mental health of our country. So when you really dig deep and think about what employees are saying, uh, it's a little scary. Score one for the National Health Service. <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Uh, Dave, anything to add to Julie's comments? I'm interviewing Paul Cusero, Emeticist's CEO, for a keynote session next month at the Kane Brothers Annual Healthcare Conference. Emeticist is a home health and hospice company that has really thrived under Paul's leadership. The company's stock price was 11 bucks a share. When he took the company's helm in 2014, it, it peaked at just over $325 a share earlier this year. Paul's managerial orientation has been greatly influenced by Fred Reichheld's book, The Loyalty Effect. Among other notable accomplishments, Reichheld was the founding partner of Bain & Company's loyalty practice and the creator of the Net Promoter Score. Not a dumb guy. Reichheld's philosophy basically boils down to the belief that treating employees well means that they will treat customers well and their companies will prosper as a result. Paul calls this applying the golden rule to business, and that's what he's put into practice at Emeticist and believes it is responsible for their stratospheric growth. He spent the first several months on the job traveling around the country and interviewing Emeticist caregivers about their jobs, what worked, what didn't, and how the company could make their work lives better. Their answers became the basis for Emeticist's strategic plan, and the rest is history. I tell this story to emphasize how important it is for leaders of healthcare companies during this period of remarkable industry turmoil 
to treat their employees as they themselves would like to be treated. Holistic and personalized benefits are a big component of that equation. Just like your mother said. Thanks, Dave. Now let's talk about two other reports, both on the employer side of things. The first is from the Business Group on Health, formerly the National Business Group on Health. The BGH survey of 136 large employers found that 76% expanded telemedicine and virtual care options for employees because of the pandemic, with the same percentage saying access to mental health services will be a top focus in 2022. The second report is from Willis Towers Watson. The Willis survey of more than 3,600 employers, including 359 U.S. companies, found that 69% plan to offer customized benefits packages next year, and 73% intend to boost their support of mental health services. Julie, do you think there's alignment between employers and employees on benefits, or is this just happy talk from big companies? Well, what I've seen over the last 12 months is that employers have gone all out to try to address employee concerns. They've gone on a major buying spree, purchasing all sorts of innovative point solutions that help their employees feel connected while working remotely or to access healthcare when it hasn't been safe to go to the doctor or certainly to get access, gosh, in almost any way to mental health support. And all this is really about making them feel heard and helping to take care of them. And that last phrase I just used is what surprises me most. It's really about helping employees feel taken care of by their employer. And that's a new way of thinking for employers because when the pandemic hit, people didn't know who to turn to their employer. And employers not only started taking care of their employees in new and different ways, but a lot of leaders also stepped up and started to really figure out what their role was to sustain the community around them. So we've really arrived at a new phase in the employee benefit world. And I think, you know, a lot of this is really real. I was ecstatic to see that 73% of employers plan to boost their support for mental health issues like stress and burnout and depression and all those things we're hearing about. It's really, if you think about it, an impressively high percentage of respondents And it addresses what you heard from employees and really speaks to society's biggest issues at the moment. So that seems very on point. So I see the alignment. I'm definitely a believer that employers are investing to keep employees, you know, first and foremost for them probably from churning and help them stabilize. And I also, unfortunately, I think we're hitting the tipping point of the number of these solutions that employers can support. So I guess the big question in my mind is, Where will employers go from here? Interesting. Thanks, Julie. Dave, what are your takeaways from the BGH and Willis surveys? How much of what employers say they're going to do is based on employee need and how much is being driven by business or market need? Per usual, Julie has done an outstanding job of synthesizing her material. I don't have anything of substance to add to her observations on the BGH and Willis survey results except to emphasize the importance of benefit design in attracting and retaining employees during this period of increasing employee turnover and raging war for talent. You know, Julie, exactly what you were talking about is going on out there. I'll use the rest of my two minutes in the sun to comment on an interesting HPR article by Shantanu Nundi and Vivian Lee that explores how employers can offer better health care to their employees. Kind of gets at the last part of your question, Dave. Mm -hmm. The gist of their article is that the pandemic has forced employers to take a more active role in their employees' collective health, both by establishing COVID workforce policies on everything from vaccinations to testing to mask wearing to working at home, but also finding out that they must develop tailored approaches for employee health, and they really can't rely on the healthcare system to do this job for them. Pretty sobering conclusion, actually. Going forward, the authors encourage employers to become much better buyers of healthcare services. Does that sound familiar? This directive comes with advice to invest in high quality telemedicine and digital health, home based services, self testing, integrated mental health services that we've talked a lot about today, and social determinants of health. The authors also emphasize the need for employers to advance value based care through their purchasing. And in this area, they encourage them to negotiate risk-based contracts where appropriate for care services. 
Collectively, these initiatives will require more internal medical expertise, better data analytics, navigation services, and strategic partnerships to enhance service offerings and increase their negotiating leverage with payers. Self-insured employers pay premium prices for largely routine care services. My biggest disappointment, and you've heard me say this a bunch of times, in healthcare, these self-insured employers don't demand more value for their healthcare purchases. This article provides practical advice for employers on how to implement strategies that deliver the high value healthcare services their employees need and deserve. Add it, Dave, thank you. Julie, anything to add to Dave's comments? The only thing we haven't really talked about um, in this whole employee benefit world is the dirty little secret that employers provide a lot of benefits and have provided benefits for years, 401k, health, et cetera. We're just in a new era of benefit provision. But how many of us actually even know what benefits our employers provide? Unless you're sick. I mean, if you're 20 or 30 something and you're healthy, you might take advantage of maybe the the Costco discount or something, but (laughs) you're certainly not taking advantage of the real stuff. So my question really is, you know, in the long run, how will employers make sure that employees are engaging in all the benefits and resources they purchased, assuming that that's really important to them? And that is the hard part. And it's the only way to really get value from the buying spree here. Employees want choice, but need to know what choices they have. So employer communication is key. And employees can only improve their situations when they take advantage of benefits. So how employers, you know, help steer or navigate them toward what's available to them and, you know, set up incentives for them to use those services, that really may make a difference here. Employers need to take a more active rather than passive approach to this situation. Thanks, Julie. Well, I guess everything will come out in the wash during open enrollment when we all see what we get and what we have to pay for. Now let's talk briefly about other big healthcare news that happened this past week. Julie, what should we know and why? Well, quite apropos of our discussion this week, the company Accolade launched what it calls a new category of personalized healthcare that takes its navigation experience and adds the care delivery services that it's acquired over the last 18 months in virtual primary care, some mental health and expert opinion. And they're really looking at delivering a much more comprehensive, longitudinal way of delivering care in a value-based way. So kudos to Raj Singh and his team for that bold move. Yeah, something to keep an eye on. Thank you. Dave, what made your healthcare headlines this past week? Julie and I are definitely in sync this morning. The Unite Us's acquisition of NowPow caught my attention this week. NowPow started on the south side of Chicago. They match individual social and healthcare needs with community resources and do a really great job of it. Along with the acquisition of the data analytics company, Carrot Health, a foresight favorite, Unite Us is now positioning itself to provide proactive and holistic care management services to large populations. Just exactly what the country needs. The emergence of companies like Unite Us and Accolade will markedly influence the future shape of the U.S. healthcare system. Good for them and good for us. Thanks, Dave. I guess it's up to me to be the downer this week. For me, it was the Fair Health report that said the average charge for a complex hospital stay for COVID was more than $300,000. Again, somebody's paying for that, and I think it's you and me. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks, David. Thank you, Julie. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to learn more about the topics we discussed, please visit our website at foresighthealth.com. You also can find a recording of this podcast and all our podcasts on the Healthcare Now Radio Network, iTunes, Spotify, and other streaming services. Subscribe now and don't miss another segment of the best 20 minutes in healthcare. Thanks for listening. I'm Dave Berta for Foresight Health.